Well, welcome and good morning. Uh, my name is Todd Miller, and I'll be your host for today's event. Thank you for taking the time out to join us. You know, as uh, Tech Canada's president and CEO, I've had the privilege uh, to work with many of you and leaders like you over the last 11 years. And it's truly been an inspiring and transformational experience. Today's event is an exclusive one. It's available to members only. And it's great to see such an awesome turnout of both members. And I know our chair community is uh, tuning in as well. So let's get to it. We're here to discuss a topic that's relevant to all of us, the economic landscape for Q3 2023 and associated important topics that impact your business. And within that discussion, the Tech Canada CEO Confidence Index for Q3 2023, which is of course a quarterly survey measuring the confidence of Canadian business leaders of small to medium-sized enterprise. This particular survey was conducted from June 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2023. And we're very pleased to share that we actually had 420 participants in this particular confidence index. We've included the most recent CEO Confidence Index uh, and the latest Anderson report in the chat area. And you're very welcome to download the reports and share them with your teams. And of course, members, you would know that that's also available through the Tech Canada app. If you have any questions, please place them in the Q&A. And if we don't get to your questions during the time allotted, we'll make sure that we get Peter's answers afterwards and follow, follow up with you offline. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the man who reviews the data provides the insights, and helps us index that information with past CEO confidence reports. He also delivers our Anderson Economic Report every month, which is available to members online, of course, at techcanada.com or through the Tech Canada app. Both the Anderson Report and the CEO Confidence Index are great resources for the tech community. So, Dr. Peter Anderson is an independent consulting economist specialing in economic forecasting. He obtained his doctorate in economics from Harvard University. Early in his career, he, career, he was the assistant chief of the Bank of Canada's research department, where he advised the governor and the Bank of Canada on economic conditions and the economic outlook. Dr. Anderson also spent several years with several major Bay Street investment dealer firms before founding Anderson Economic Research, Inc., he acts as a filter, separating the signals from the noise in order to provide clients with useful information that they really need. So without further ado, I am very pleased to introduce my friend and our expert, Dr. Peter Anderson. Welcome, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Todd, it is so good to be uh, with you today and uh, to have the opportunity to speak to tech members. Um, I really enjoy these sessions, Todd, and I especially appreciate the conversational tone that we have between the two of us, because really you are the representative of the members that are on the line, uh, on the call, and uh, the questions and the discussion that you are coming forward with, uh, it's what everybody I think is thinking about. So the survey that we we have just finished is really up to date. I mean, it, Todd, it is still July, and we closed this survey off basically at the beginning of July. It was the end of June, beginning of July, and hey, it's the 25th today. So the survey responses that we are looking at are very much real-time uh, real pieces of information. So I have just jotted down about six different things that I picked up from this uh, survey. First of all, um, the majority of our members are still planning to increase their payroll budgets over the next 12 months. 52% say yes, they will see more people working for them um, a year from now, only 10%, only 10% are predicting a decline. So that is a remarkable finding, given what's going on with interest rates. Uh, number two, inflation. Our members are very concerned 
only 19, only one in five expect inflation to be under 4% next year. Only one in five. Um, as far as profits are concerned, it's very encouraging to see our members feel that they'll be relatively stable, Relati yeah. relatively stable profitability in a situation of rising interest rates and a situation of inflation, which is also affecting costs as well, costs of production going up. So it means our members are learning to live with a higher cost, higher inflation environment. And uh, there are a number of things that they're undertaking that are very interesting. Um, artificial intelligence mentioned for the first time uh, in one of our surveys. Automation uh, is still the big one, but I was surprised to see the number of members that did mention uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, interest rates, well, interest rates are going up. And when we did our survey in June, we hadn't got to 5%. Mm -hmm. But basically, the story was, if interest rates get to 5%, 80% of our members will experience a negative effect. 82% yeah. of our members feeling a shock at a 5% level. Now, the Bank of Canada did raise interest rates in July. They raised them on the 12th of July. The operating rate is now 5%. Uh, but you know, it's more than just interest rates. So this is another one of my kind of messages, one of, my, one of the points that I got from the survey. There's a credit squeeze taking place. And progressively, more and more of our members are telling us that it's getting trickier. It's getting harder to get to get a loan at the bank. Um, this is the way the numbers have run. Uh, a year ago, 26% of our members said that credit tightening was a problem. 26%. So that number is now up to almost 40. Wow. Came in 39% in this survey that was done through the month of June. Yeah. And then I had to also ask a question about working from home because it's on everybody's lips, it's on everybody's mind. And it's it's a strong response. 60% of our responses say that work from home is going to continue in some form, either 100% work for home, from home or some kind of staged hybrid model uh, of several days at the office and then the rest working from home. But it's interesting that 40%, which is still a, a big percent, 40% of our members say 100% in office. So yeah. there you go. This is going to be really interesting to follow. Uh, with 60% of our members saying work from home in some form is going to continue, but a solid number, 40%, saying that it's going to be 100% in office. And of course, so, I, noticed, I noticed, Dr. Anderson, in, in our report, of course, you have the ability to break out regions given uh, certain levels of participation. And that number certainly had some deviation uh, in terms of work from home in the different provinces. Well, exactly. Uh, Alberta, um, dear to your heart, of course, but Alberta, um, we have almost 60% saying 100% in office. Yeah, it's almost two thirds saying 100 percent in office. It's not quite that. It's under 60 percent. It comes out of 56 percent of the responses say 100 percent back to the office. Uh, now, that's down in Quebec. It's under 30. That's right. So it's double the response in Alberta to what you're seeing in Quebec. And Ontario is kind of like that, too. Ontario's uh, just over 30 percent saying uh, that it'll be 100 percent in office, so it's it's quite a it's quite a, a shift regionally. I guess the other thing I'd mention is that I was surprised with the response to 
What are you going to do with office space? What is your need for office space? Only 15% of our members say they're going to reduce their office space needs. Yeah. And some say that they're going to increase their office space because they want to provide the amenities uh, that will be looked on favorably uh, by their uh, their workers and staff. So, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Very interesting. And uh, we have some slides to show today too, right? Yes, we certainly do. And uh, I love slides, as you know, Todd. Uh, that's why I have so many in my monthly report. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's take a look at my slide deck. Yeah, perfect. And, We've got one for you, Dr. Anderson. Yeah, let me take a look. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. I can actually see it now. That's great. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about this title slide for a moment. Um, you know, this this title slide is actually more important than you'd think because there's a feeling out there, Todd, that inflation is coming down and it's coming down quickly and we'll be out of the woods on this problem before you know it. But I'm, I'm a bit hesitant on that. Uh, I want to warn people that I think and it's not only me that thinks this, it's also the Bank of Canada. I think inflation is going to get stuck at around 3% for a while. Mm -hmm. And that means next year. So in 2024, my expectation would be that we're going to be living in an inflationary world at about 3%. Now, mm -hmm. what does that number mean, Todd? It's basically twice the inflation rate that we experienced since the year 2000, uh, going right up to the pandemic. Hmm. We were running at under 2% inflation. So it's not quite double the inflation rate that we were used to over the past 10, 15, 20 years, but it's a lot more. So this is a different environment, I think, that our members are going to be facing as we go through the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to take a lot of smarts and a lot of adaptability to make this work and to get the favorable profitability outcome that our members do expect. Yeah. Anyway, hey, let's take a look at the next slide. Todd, go ahead. You're going to say something. Well, I, I, I was just, I, I know we were talking offline, uh, Dr. Anderson, and just this, and, I, and you might actually be going here as it relates to inflation. I know often our members, um, and I've been asked this question as well, as we think about, you know, that inflationary number, you know, that 3% and how, uh, you know, if we break that out, to break out the components of that, which, you know, um, I know there's many elements of CPI that's included in there, but if we break out fuel and food and some of those uh, those items, I mean, we're, we're actually seeing uh, an increase in, in those numbers in a substantive way. Yeah, well, that's right. And the big, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in all of these numbers uh, has to do with gasoline prices. Uh, we can all remember what gasoline prices were like this time a year ago. Uh, we see these prices, you know, every time we go past the gas station today. We are not going to get the same kind of decline in gasoline prices in the next year that we've got in the year that has just passed us. So I think that's that's one of the key messages. Uh, right now, Todd, the Consumer Price Index in Canada for the month of June, the total index is up by 2.8% from June 12 months earlier. Hmm. However, if we put gasoline to one side, we're up by 4.0%. So you can see the, the role that gasoline has played. And heaven forbid, what if gasoline prices actually start to go up again? Right. So, you know, so that anyway, my feeling is this, that the consumer price index in Canada, 2.8% sounds really great. We're getting down. We're getting down closer to two. My feeling is that in the next three months, when we see the data in August, it'll be for the month of July. And then the data in September and October, I think it won't be 2.8 going down to 2.6. It'll be 2.8 going back up to 
And this whole narrative that inflation is really coming down and will keep coming down, I think that'll get people scratching their heads and starting to worry about it. Wow. And of course, that uh, is your opening comments and your uh, your view of the confidence index and the data that we collected uh, as it relates to interest and the pressures that our members are feeling. Um, I have to assume that that's going to continue to be a challenge. Well, exactly, because it's going to be inflation that drives interest rates. And uh, the people who are going to be pushing the button uh, are the central bankers. And this is why I wanted to give you the latest um, the latest story coming from Ottawa. Uh, Tiff Macklem is the governor of the Bank of Canada. And... The Bank of Canada raised interest rates again on July the 12th. And at, at that time, it was incumbent upon the governor to stand up uh, and make a statement to the country as to what he saw going on. And so that's why I have this uh, second slide with some, some of the sentences underlined. And, and these are his exact words. What I've done is I've gone to his press statement, to his press release, and yeah. I've, I've basically um, repeated exactly his words. So these are not my words, Todd. These are Governor Macklin's words as of the 12th of July. And hey, that's only basically two weeks ago, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. So, so let's take a look at these things. Underlying inflation more persistent than we expected. Who is the we? The Bank of Canada, the people that have their fingers on the interest rate button. Point number, sentence number two, again, his words, we are seeing persistent pressure in services prices. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it, Todd? Because yeah. we're all headed out to restaurants, uh, we're all headed out to entertainment venues, uh, we're all going on vacation again, uh, and services under pressure. So persistent pressure in services prices. Now look at this third item. And again, this is the governor of the Bank of Canada speaking. Wage growth has been between 4% and 5%. Wage growth between four and 5%. Well, why not? Because grocery prices as of June were up 9.1% from 12 months earlier. So no. if it's that much more expensive, Todd, to buy your groceries, of course you're going to want to push hard to get more in terms of wages and salaries. And that has to be a big driver for inflation. Because the cost of sales, so much of it, is in wage and salary compensation. Yeah. And by the way, um, that grocery number, 9.1%, that's the consumer price index, sub-index for groceries. But they have lots of details within that category. Bakery products, bakery products, just under a 13% increase from a year ago. Well, wow. so, you know, and I worry, Todd, because what's going on with Ukraine and Russia with respect to grain shipments? And there right. you go. Yeah. Anyway, uh, in terms of expectations, um, they're still high. And <laughs> that, certainly, that certainly fits with what our members are, are telling us, because only 19 percent of our members only 19% think inflation will be below 4% in the next 12 months. Yep. And so the Bank of Canada recognizes that. And so this is, again, the governor's words, that CPI inflation is forecast, forecast by who? Forecast by the Bank of Canada to remain about 3% for the next year. And finally, this last statement has got a little bit of code kind of code speak in it. Our job is not done until inflation is centered on our 2% target. 
In other yeah. words, they want to anchor. They want to anchor inflation at 2%. They don't want inflation to come down and for it to go up quickly. So to me, that means that interest rates are not going to come down all that fast. And there's probably more to come on the upside. Yeah. Well, again, that was, uh, that's your earlier comment that, uh, you know, we were making, uh, Dr. Anderson, that, you know, how, how that's going to impact our members in particular in small and medium-sized enterprise as uh, more pressure is placed on uh, uh, any form of debt. Well, I think that interest rates have a particularly important impact on small and medium-sized businesses because they you know, don't really have our, our members, smaller business members, don't really have access to capital markets uh, the way large corporations have in terms of access to corporate debt markets or corporate equity markets. So there's a, there's a kind of a narrower range. I, I got to ask this question. It's just relevant to our conversation. It just came in from one of our members, and you know, and, and it's just this whole element of you know high debt levels. Uh, you know, cost of food is you know uh, as you just pointed out, uh, you know nine percent, ten percent on bakery uh, goods. Uh, is there a risk that we could start uh, seeing some massive defaults, and and uh, of course, would that put big pressures on the banks? Well, it's going to be interesting, Charlie, because the defaults that we are more likely to see are going to be with commercial real estate rather than residential real estate. Uh, you know, uh, back in the great financial crisis, it was homeowners that were defaulting and turning the keys into the banks. This time, it's going to be office buildings and shopping centers, uh, I think, that are at risk, especially office buildings. Uh, let's put it this way, Todd. If your office building is only occupied, is only 50% occupied, doesn't that mean that the rent is going to be a lot less? And how do you then value the building? The yeah. building is probably going to be worth 30 to 40% less, uh, mm -hmm. just in terms of a valuation basis, you know, in terms of the people that are in the office building and the people that are paying rent. So it looks to me as if we could be looking at um, really a, a tidal wave of bankruptcies uh, with uh, commercial real estate. And oh. it'll be, I think, it'll be most pronounced in the United States. And in the United States, you have a different banking system. You have a a large, a very large number of smaller regional uh, banks. And it's those small, smaller regional banks that are heavily exposed to commercial real estate loans. Yeah. Uh, in Canada, our banking system, well, we do have about 80 lending institutions in Canada, but in the United States, you've got over 4,000 banks. So it very well could be that we're going to hear uh, news as the months go by of distress in the U.S. banking system. But you know what, Todd? That makes our banks cautious as well. Because yeah. if the headlines are talking about problems with U.S. banks, you can bet your bottom dollar that our Canadian banks are going to say to themselves, well, we have to be pretty careful on who we lend money to as well. Sure. So that's where I see the credit squeeze uh, getting yeah. worse. Let's just take a look. Oh, hey, I'm sorry. Todd. I was just going to go with the next slide here. Yeah, uh, just into um, easier to look at terms than okay. the last slide. The last slide had a lot of words, and I apologize for that. This slide doesn't have so many words, but what it says is that we are now at five percent with the policy interest rate in Canada. And that means that the prime lending rate that our members face when they go to the banks, the prime lending rate is way up in 8% territory. And the likelihood is that the spread that our members will get from the prime business rate to the rate that's offered to us, to them, that spread will widen. So there we go. We have 82% of our members saying that if the policy interest rate hits 5%, 
they feel a negative effect. They feel an interest rate shock. So anyway, um, this is, uh, you know, I, I've talked about some of these numbers, but I wanted to put them into um, concrete form here. Total CPI inflation looks wonderful, right? 2.8%. Wow. But again, if you don't include gasoline, that would be 4.0%. Hmm. And then underneath this, I have put down four different measures of underlying core inflation. Uh, the common one that we think of all the time is the consumer price index, not, not for all items, but excluding food and energy. That's the simple one. That comes out at 3.5% June over June. But these other member, uh, these other measures are fancier measures put together by the Bank of Canada, but the Bank of Canada thinks they're important. So these top, the 3.7, the 3.9, and the 5.1, these are various ways of measuring what the Bank of Canada thinks the underlying trend is in inflation. And you can see these are, none of these are, Anywhere close to being under three percent, yeah, so that kind of supports what Governor Macklin was talking about. Sure, and you know it's interesting. Uh, you know, a question. Uh, and hopefully, I can do this justice. But uh, that came in uh, as we're as we're just having this conversation about interest uh, or sorry, inflationary rates. And when if you think about um, you know the elements that we've been talking about that our interests uh, and how that's all connected. Uh, and you think about all the different components of CPI, and you've obviously started to break things out here. What, what are the? What, what do you think are the? Uh, what's your estimate of which variables start to give first? I mean, do, do, you, do you have any speculation there at all, Peter? Uh, in terms of what uh, what prices are going to be coming down the fastest? Yeah, exactly. Well, I think it's going to be goods prices uh, because the supply chain has been improving. And we have more supply capacity for physical durable goods. Um, you have, uh, in addition to that, some signs that capital spending is starting to cool off. So a lot of the, you know, the chain of supply that goes into providing machinery and equipment that is starting to soften as well. Uh, and I guess if you go a step further into automobiles, used car prices and new car prices, the heat is starting to come off them. So yeah. that is something that is good news. Now, with respect to this 2.8% year-over-year 12-month change, Todd, one of the reasons that we had a small month-to-month -month increase between May and June, uh, it was for special reasons, like telecommunications prices came down between oh. May and June. You know, to me, that really doesn't reflect an interest rate response. And the same also occurred in some travel packages. So... The reason that we had this latest May to June cooling off, I think it was to some extent um, one-off kind of developments. Let me go to this next slide here to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Todd, this slide is, I titled it the base year effect. Now that's an important term, and I think it's important to keep this phrase kind of at our fingertips the base year effect. So what I mean by this is take a look at the left-hand side of this chart. You can see the bars are pretty high. Take a look as you get into 2023, the bars aren't as high. So what that means is in the month of June, you can see that we took out a big increase in June of last year. In June of last year, it was more than 0 0.6. And we took that out and we replaced it by something that was just a little over 1%, 0 0.1. 
So that means that, you know, if you take out a big month to month change 12 months ago, that the 12 month change is coming down. Now, this is my point. Take a look at 2022. Take a look at July. Take a look at August and take a look at September in 2022. The month to month changes were pretty small. My thinking is that in July, in July, August and September this year, those month to month changes are going to be bigger than what they were in July, August and September last year. So what that means is that 2.8 is going to go up because we're taking out a couple of months of small increases and we're adding in, I think, a couple of months of bigger increases. Not as big as they used to be, but still bigger than what we saw in July, August and September last year. So that's one of the reasons why I think we are going to see that 2.8 go up to 3.0, 3.1, 3.3, perhaps, as we go through the data uh, that comes out in in August, September and October. There's always a one month lag, of course, in the data. So I I hope I haven't confused everybody. Oh, that's a it's very good, Dr. Anderson. Very interesting view and, and perspective and the dialogue is even more meaningful, right? Uh, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, and I think my point is that the latest bar that we have on the right-hand side for June of 2023, I think that was just a, a one-off week month. I think we're going to be back at something like uh, 0.3, maybe 0.4 uh, for the next couple of months. Yeah, very interesting. Do we have another uh, slide? Yeah, let me finish off my slide deck with this one. Yeah. Um, this is Canada's population growth. And I put these numbers together over the weekend for us, Todd, because something really big is happening in Canada. Take a look at the number for the second quarter of this year. It's over 3% total population growth. This compares with less than 1% in the United States. This is huge. No other developed country has population growth anywhere close to what we're seeing in Canada. We haven't seen population growth like this, Todd, in Canada since the mid-1950s, since 1955 to 1956. And this, I think, uh, is, you know, people need things. They need things, places to stay. They, they need food. They need services. They need transportation. And this is an economic driver. So my feeling is that uh, we are not going to see, you know, we're not going to see the need for the Bank of Canada to lower interest rates anytime soon. Uh, this is going to provide a strong push, especially on the housing market. And, uh, you know, if we continue to see extremely tight housing markets, upward pressure on rents, um, you know, that kind of triggers inflation thoughts. What people think they should charge for their products, uh, what people think they should get paid. So this, uh, this kind of population growth, the only place you can see population growth this high, Todd, is in parts of Africa. Uh, oh. And we haven't seen this uh, in Canada as I said, for, you know, whatever, 70 years or so. So, and, and just to be clear, uh, maybe it's obvious, but uh, this what's driving this is our immigration uh, activity that's uh, happening in Canada these days? Exactly. 98% of this population growth is coming from immigration. Yeah. And also, and June was a, it was a watershed month, Todd, because we have a population clock in Ottawa. And on the 16th of June, uh, Canada's population reached 40 million people. Yeah. So, 
Dr. Anderson, when I, when I, uh, there's, I know there's, I'm sure many of our members, I know all of our members are, you know, obviously tuned into uh, various economic reports and dialogue. I was reading uh, from a, uh, on a different paper about the immigration patterns and how part of that immigration, which is creating a bit of an issue for us, is a lot of it is coming from uh, students um, or it's coming from individuals that are, of course, bringing their family. So the individual is working, so working in, in our, in other words, producing in our economy, but the family members are included in the total number, but aren't actually producing uh, in the economic sense. Uh, perspective on how to break down immigration? Really, it really cuts two ways, Todd, doesn't it? Because uh, we have a shortage of workers in the United States. And that is putting upward pressure on wage costs and, and so on. In Canada, we need workers. Uh, and we also, we also need immigrants to keep our population from declining. Uh, I guess the issue that I'm kind of, you know, thinking about and throwing up in the air is that on the one hand, the immigrants are going to need things and services immediately. They're going to need places to live. Uh, they're going to need services. Uh, they're going to uh, they're going to have to shop for food. How quickly will they get in the workforce to kind of um, help on the supply side with workers? Um, yeah. My feeling is that. Yeah, they are showing up. Uh, Statistics Canada makes a big point of saying that a lot of the job growth that we've seen in Canada is with immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, um, I'm saying that not every immigrant is going to get a job right away, but every immigrant is going to need things right away. So yeah. it very well could be that the immigration uh, in terms of, you know, how it plays out and how it balances out, you know, it could be that immigration is going to be a factor keeping inflation higher than it might otherwise be. In other words, sure. maybe if we didn't have this kind of population growth, maybe if the population was growing at a rate that we saw back in 2018, 2019, maybe we wouldn't have as much inflation pressure in the system right now. So with that stand to reason, just to build on that for a moment, uh, obviously we're, 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 we're focused on, in, uh, on our Canadian situation, but uh, what's going to happen in inflation in the States? Well, my feeling is that inflation in the States is going to be under more upward pressure because they really do have a serious uh, shortage of people. Uh, their population is only growing at half of 1% per year. And, uh, you know, they are losing the, the a lot of the immigrants that have managed to get into the United States. They're passing right through and coming back up to Canada. So there is a shortage of workers uh, in the United States. And uh, to me, that means upward pressure on cost of production. I, I heard a uh, comment the other day uh, from some of our members that one of the forces that are trying to uh, steal the employee from their facilities are work from home based organizations out of the states that are coming in and grabbing individuals from Canada and saying, well, you can work from home and uh, in Canada, but you're going to be working actually in the states. Uh, interesting uh, new, new shift in uh, the reality of uh, employment. Well, you know, I'd have to talk to my international tax accountant uh, to get him to explain to me how that works. Uh, you know, uh, who gets the taxes? Does the CRA get them or does the IRS get them? I'm not going there, but uh, it is an interesting query. So back on inflation and, and interest rates, and obviously in the in your latest, uh, the Anderson report that we all uh, have access to, clearly housing, uh, housing situations continue to be... Uh, it's just a, a pressure cooker in Canada, right? And uh, directly tied to inflation or sorry, into uh, immigration. Well, I think that's right. And, um, you know, I do have the good fortune to connect quite directly with some of Canada's biggest home builders. 
And what I have been hearing is very interesting, Todd. I'm hearing that um, immigrants are very housing focused, that there is a high priority put on housing by immigrants. And it very well could be that Canada has a, a point system, of course, for its uh, immigration policy. And a lot of the immigrants that do come to Canada are, are very well trained and very well educated and actually can get into the situation where they are in the housing market a lot sooner than you might expect. And mm -hmm. it's interesting that one of the home builders that I was talking to, and this was a home builder in Atlantic Canada, Todd, he was telling me that uh, the demand uh, coming from immigrants was particularly strong for new single family homes, not just for existing resale homes, but for new single family homes. And he was pleasantly surprised to see that his sales, his home sales were definitely getting a boost from immigration. So, you know, the, the common uh, uh, I guess misconception is that immigrants are going to have to live in rental accommodation for the first six or seven years that they're in the country. And then once they're established, they will get into the new housing market. But no, it doesn't seem to be that way at all. Ownership is definitely a priority, it seems, with our uh, immigrant community. Yeah, lots of lots of pressures for sure and challenges. Uh, get, I'm going to go to the uh, the word that I don't think we've used too much. Uh, I don't think we've used it all today, which is kind of surprising to me. Uh, the R word, uh, recession. What uh, what's where, where are we going? What's I mean? I know we've got inflation going on. We've got interest rates. We where, what's your take on uh, the uh, the big recession? I know it's all over our, our reports, uh, but let's let's have a conversation about your view on recession. Well, you know, that's that's a hot topic, and uh, it's on the razor's edge right now, this issue. Uh, a lot of the um, forecasters who have been the most pessimistic are changing gears and are saying that it looks like um, we are able to live with higher inflation and higher interest rates, and that the underlying uh, platform that we're operating from has changed and interest rates are not having the same shockwave effect that you would expect uh, based on past performance, past behavior. So we are looking at some indicators that are really saying the recession risk is fading. I wouldn't say it's on the back burner, but we have seen home sales uh, pick up uh, we have seen consumer confidence improve as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, this is uh, in the United States, for example, today we get the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. And Todd, it has come up a fair bit uh, since uh, the beginning of the year. Uh, hasn't gotten back into comfortable territory, but it has improved. And also there is the big one. The stock market. Mm -hmm. If you look at what has happened to the S&P 500 or to the Dow Jones Industrial Average as being kind of a marker of financial confidence, you're looking at some pretty big gains here in the overall indexes. So there has been this shift tide away from the brink, saying that if there is a recession, it doesn't look like it's going to happen in the next 90 days, maybe not the next 180 days. But yeah. I am still worried. I am still worried. And I'm worried for the simple reason that we have something called a leading indicator index. Mm -hmm. that, that index has declined for 15 consecutive months. Mm -hmm. It's down by about 8% from where it was 12 months ago. Wow. And this indicator is designed to track the business cycle. Hmm. I guess the point is, though, Todd, it's designed to track the business cycles that we've had up to now. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Maybe it's not going to be tracking this new business cycle. So, mm-hmm. you know, the old statement that past performance does not guarantee future results. You know, you get your stockbroker telling you that quite often as he's telling you to buy this or buy that. Yeah. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Maybe, you know, maybe it's all turned upside down by the pandemic and, um, and what that has done to hand up demand and so on. Well, I'm, just, still, I'm still on recession alert. And our members are too. Uh, Todd, before, before we move on from this, I just wanted to point out uh, that what our members are saying, uh, here we go, about a recession. So almost half of our members, yep. almost half, just under 50%. They think a recession is a certainty or highly likely. The number is 46% of the responses. It's interesting, uh, Peter, because that takes me to the next question, really. I mean, the, the members, our members, are they're kind of sending a mixed signal, right? They're, they have uh, low economic confidence uh, based on that comment, um, or relatively low. Uh, but they're also, uh, um, they have positive uh, intentions around profitability and recruitment. Um, that's coming out of the the survey as well. What, what's your view there? Well, Todd, I yeah, there's um, there's a bit of a head a bit of a head scratcher, isn't it? Uh, because I think our members feel that they have pricing power. Okay. Yeah, we have almost sixty percent of our members expecting their prices to go up over the next year. Hmm. So I think that's critical. And this is only only six percent of our members think their prices will go down yeah. over the next year. So this is a bit counter, isn't it, to this recession talk? You know, in yeah. a recession, you'd think prices are coming down. Um, you'd think house prices are coming down for sure, which they're not. Yeah. Uh, but you would think that overall, you would see more in the way of price declines. So 57% of our members see higher prices, and there's also uh, a positive outlook still for company revenues. Yeah. So, so you're right. There's a there's kind of a an issue here. Yeah. How can how can people be so optimistic on company revenues if there's such a strong feeling? that a recession is highly likely. Yeah, but it's an excellent point that you bring into the the discussion, uh, Peter, you know, and that our members do believe that they can kind of almost keep pace uh, with price increases, right? So uh, it'll be interesting to watch that as time goes on. We talked earlier on about uh, AI, and I know that we we inserted a question on AI and artificial intelligence, of course, uh, inside of the, uh, the confidence. And I just... We'd love to hear more conversation about you know your view on AI changing and as it, as you relate to productivity measures. Uh, how, how do you think this is all going to uh, unfold for us? Well, this is the efficiency uh, option. Um, you know, I think our members are feeling um, positive about their profitability prospects, but I think there is a, a real interest in efficiency. And and the two the two things that are mentioned are automation and also artificial intelligence. So it's it's kind of hard, isn't it, Todd, to put your finger on exactly what does artificial intelligence entail, you know, for our members. Um, hard to know exactly what the examples. You know, what are the hard physical examples of what artificial intelligence means? I can understand automation a bit better than I can understand what artificial intelligence means. Yeah. Uh, And that's interesting. I'd mention is that the other thing that comes through, I think, quite loud and clear is that our members put a really high priority on sales and marketing efforts. Mm -hmm. 
sales and marketing. Now, Todd, how do you do that with artificial intelligence, right? It seems to me that, you know, to me, sales and marketing, it's an in-person thing. I think it's probably very difficult to, you know, ramp up your sales and marketing efforts uh, with uh, without being in person. Yeah, uh, I really find it's hard. How can you be virtual and be a good salesman? Yeah. Well, there's uh, all kinds of interesting content that I know Tech Canada, shameless plug for, for ourselves, I guess, that uh, we have with our speaker community and experts in this topic that I'm sure many of our members are going to be uh, you know, experiencing uh, in, the, in the coming months uh, as they think about their own exploratory of AI. Um, Curious, I, I, and I just because I, I think the the correlation between AI and automation, I think you, that's bang on, Peter. I think that's a great point. Um, just, I am curious though. I'm, I'm switching gears on you again, as I often do. I apologize for that. But back to kind of the interest rate uh, uh, query, and you know, of course, the speculation that interest interest rates are going to continue to climb. Uh, how, how best? Um, how should members prepare for ongoing interest rates? Cash is king. That would be my answer. Mm. Yep, cash is king. Uh, I don't think it's time to uh, push the risk envelope. Uh, and this is what makes it a little bit difficult here to talk about these efficiency options. Uh, you know, these initiatives uh, to increase auto automation and decrease, increase artificial intelligence. Maybe you need financing to do that. Uh, yeah. So let's keep it simple, Todd. What are the simple things that we can do that yeah. are cost efficient and uh, budget friendly uh, without going overboard and and making a big commitment to you know a fancy new operating system, fancy new ways of doing something that. People aren't really sure exactly how it's going to work out or how to manage it and control it. Yeah. Uh, so, but basically, in a situation like this, cash is king. Uh, you don't want to be beholden to your bank manager. Uh, the possibility out there, Todd, is that the bank manager is going to cut back on your line of credit. And the bank manager is going to increase the spread that you have to pay in order to get a loan the spread on top of uh, the prime loan rate. So, yeah, no, and 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 of course that showed up inside the, the index as well, uh, just the pressures. I think some of our members are now starting to feel more pressure as it relates to, uh, I guess, bank discussions. But again, another way of countering that is to get the revenues flowing. And so yeah. sales, sales and marketing, I think <laughs> that's the last place you want to cut back. Yeah. Uh, over the next six to nine months, you you want to expand your sales and marketing yeah. to to uh, protect yourself when it comes to cash. Better to get the cash from new business than to get a bank loan. Yeah, wonderful. The uh, a question uh, we you know we often talk about supply chain issues, uh, Peter. We have been talking about supply chain issues frequently in our in our uh, shows that we put on. Um, but here's a more specific question uh, relating to supply chain. But any comments or thoughts on the impact of the port strike uh, occurring in Metro Vancouver and the disruption of supply chain? Do you have any uh, any perspective on that uh, that topic specifically? Well, this is something that really does worry me uh, that uh, we have a legitimate reason for union workers to feel they've been left behind uh, by cost of living pressures. And I think that the strikes that we have uh, are going to be very counterproductive uh, and perhaps push interest rates higher than they might need to go. Or let's put it this way, perhaps keep interest rates at current levels for longer than we need to have them there. So, mm -hmm. a reversal in the supply chain, I think we are very much at risk for that. Um, what I see, though, is that in a lot of supply situations that I'm involved in, uh, companies are really, they're becoming disbelievers in the recession risk. 
and they are bringing back production that they had kind of put on the as needed list or you know we can do this later so to me i'm getting the message that more and more companies uh, big companies are feeling that the recession is not going to come and and they can ramp up production and build up inventories right now uh, in response to that feeling Wow, oh, interesting. The uh, we we mentioned. Uh, I'm just sensitive to our time. We've got a few minutes left, and uh, we still got a few questions. And uh, as I mentioned at the onset of the show, uh, uh, questions that we don't get to, we'll be sure and uh, follow up after the fact. Um, we touched on obviously this uh, sad uh, conflict that is continuing uh, in with uh, the Russian uh, invasion into Ukraine, and of course all of the the uh, the sadness that's going on there. Grain deal, uh, obviously, that's uh, you know now that's gone in essence. Uh, Russia's declared that. Other implications that uh, you think that we're going to experience here in Canada as a result of this ongoing conflict? No, well, that's my that's my big concern is really the uh, world food supply situation, um, and I guess I'm also worried uh, about oil uh, because. At this point, we have kind of put the oil worry and risk on the back on the back burner, and uh, that could change very quickly. So, I guess what I'm saying, Todd, is that the economy is vulnerable to unexpected shocks coming from a food prices uh, or b coming from oil. Uh, it could be that if Russia is going to try and be as disruptive as possible, well, grain is certainly one thing, but also oil would be something else. Would OPEC, would the uh, traditional OPEC members uh, cooperate and increase their supply uh, in order to offset any disruptive Russian moves on oil? I doubt it. At least I doubt it would happen right away. Mm -hmm. And so this is what has happened in previous business cycles, Todd. We thought that we were going to get through them. And then we had an oil shock. And this was kind of typical of the 1970s. And the oil shock really did come at a time when the underlying economy was, in fact, quite vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So... Keep our fingers crossed on that. Yeah. Um, maybe just on that note, uh, maybe uh, any other thoughts on uh, crude and uh, oil prices? Uh, on yes, yes. Let me just make a comment on that because what I find right now is that the chatter around, around the markets is that oil prices are going to be rising in the second half of this year. Right. That is kind of out there as uh, something we hear a lot of commentary about. And so think of how that would play out if oil prices were to start to go up again. You know, we, we're we looking at $80 now for, for Brent. Uh, what if we get back into the, the 90s again for the international world price? Hmm. What does that mean for us at the pumps? That's right. And, you know, we're looking awfully good at the latest total inflation number coming down to 2.8. Hey, if it weren't for gasoline collapsing, it would have been 4.0, the latest number. Right. So, so we don't want to go back to 4.0 for the total index because we have a flip-flop on oil and gasoline prices. There you go. Yeah. And that would just add to uh, the whole conversation we've already had about more pressures, uh, inflationary pressures, and then perhaps even interest rates. So 
Listen, uh, Dr. Anderson, it's uh, been a pleasure. Uh, I know we're coming to the bottom of the hour, uh, and I'd just like to thank all the members uh, and chairs who attended today uh, and taking part in the surveys that we sent out, the CEO Confidence Index, that is. And uh, obviously, that's a big part of our organization. We can learn even more together as more and more of our members participate. And uh, again, we, uh, having said that, we had tremendous participation in this past survey and uh, continues to climb. So thank you for that, members, and uh, for your uh, active engagement. Uh, you will see uh, an email request come through for uh, from our uh, within our newsletters members. You'll see uh, uh, in terms of the, the survey highlights. Um, uh, please, uh, your opinion matters. Uh, we look forward to your your feedback back uh, within the newsletter. Uh, we are a peer to peer support network, as you know, uh, and we're about to hit 2000 members across Canada. That's pretty remarkable uh, in terms of the growth that we're experiencing and uh, how value this uh, this model is for all of our members and our chairs alike. Uh, this has been very, very informative. Uh, Peter, I always enjoy the opportunity that I uh, get to have hosting you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Anderson, for participating so fully. The work you do with us uh, really helps Tech Canada and our community, and it helps us uh, understand and react to the opportunities that we're all facing, as well as the challenges within the Canadian business landscape. We look forward to the next CEO Confidence Index, which will be coming out not so long from today. Before we know it, we'll be back together, Peter. Thank you all for attending, and thank you, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Todd. Thanks very much.